Hello and welcome to the France Vanquette interview. Today we are turning our attention to Burma, a country that has been in the news over the past few months. And this time it, it appears to be good news. Burma's President Thein Sein has introduced a reform process that has led to the easing of sanctions by Western nations. And perhaps the most explicit sign of progress has been opposition leader Aung San Suu Kyi's European tour, which has ended dec decades of her isolation. But even as Aung San Suu Kyi was delivering her Nobel acceptance speech in Norway, thousands of miles away in a remote Western Burmese region, a state of emergency was clamped down after the majority Buddhist community uh, had ethnic clashes with the minority Rohingya Muslims. Uh, now, this is a, a stateless people that is often referred to as the world's, one of the world's most persecuted people. Joining us now to discuss the situation that's happening in Burma is Mr. David Scott Matheson. Uh, he is the researcher on Burma at Human Rights Watch. It's good to have you with us, Mr. Thank Matheson. You. I was talking about, you know, the easing of uh, economic sanctions. What's your opinion of that? Do you think this has been good for Burma overall? I think some of the, the removal of sanctions the, and the suspension of the EU common position, the repeal of some of the, the US sanctions, um, have been uh, in response to some of the, the very positive reforms that we've seen in the last year. But it's Human Rights Watch's position that, that the total removal of many of these sanctions was, was premature and that, in fact, what could have helped the reforms even further was if the European Union, the United States um, and other sanctioning countries had have maintained some measures that could have actually helped the reforms. And what we mean by that is, is actually keeping some reforms on in, in terms of investment bans and, um, and, and other uh, measures that, that keep big international businesses at bay, to give the Burmese government time to actually put in place a legal framework, a regulatory framework, uh, that will help to actually preserve the environment to mitigate some of the effects on, on human rights and the displacement of potential displacement of people, land rights, uh, that some of the sanctions could have been very positive for. So on the one hand, we think that the removal of sanctions, we always called for that, uh, but they were probably done a bit too prematurely. And there was a way to turn what have long been perceived as very negative sanctions into a very positive mood over the next year or so to assist the Burmese government to actually help the reform process. So do you think it's too premature now? Can, will, will this impede the Burmese government's efforts to... I, I don't think it will impede the Burmese government's efforts to reform, but they could have been used in a very positive way. Um, and, and hopefully the removal of those, those sanctions won't, won't make things worse. Um, I don't necessarily think they will for the reform process, but it could mean that the government now faces even greater challenges in putting into place laws and capacity to actually absorb some of the, the investments um, that might be coming in. Now, our concerns are that a lot of investment that Burma might see in the coming years will be in the nat natural resource sector. Um, in resource extraction. And, and quite often some of those investments have a very negative impact on the environment, on human rights and, and on land issues. Um, so that's something that I think the sanctioning countries, Europeans, the Americans and lots of other investors need to watch very carefully that the removal of their sanctions haven't exactly exacerbated um, a situation on the ground and made things worse and allowed corruption to thrive and, and arbit arbitrary power to thrive as well. What about your work? Has the opening and the reform process helped you get access to places that previously you probably didn't have? In, in some ways, yes. I travelled to the country for the first time um, in January, February this year after being blacklisted for a very long time. Um, was subsequently then not given another visa, um, but then was allowed to, to attend uh, ceasefire talks between Shan insurgents and, and government officials and military officials in northeastern Burma uh, in May. So it's, it's very positive that I'm allowed in sometimes and, and for some reasons. And what I think the government needs to do is actually to open the country up even further and to allow journalists, human rights workers 
and critics of the government to actually come into the country and see for themselves. Well, one of the things that's been said by some experts about the reform process is that, uh, you know, there is a danger that the opening up could actually open up some of the conflicts between uh, ethnic groups. Burma, you know, is a multi-ethnic nation. Sometimes uh, there are rivals. Mm. Do you mirror th these concerns? I, th I think it's certainly a, a big concern of ours. Um, and I, I don't think it should be blamed on the new openness and some of the promises of reform. I, I think it, it should be seen as uh, unresolved issues in a lot of ethnic areas and existing community tensions, certainly in, in, in Western Burma, that have been simmering for a very long time, I mean, for decades. Um, and you know, one would hope that actually the reform process will help to resolve these issues in the long term, not exacerbate them. Um, but I don't think that the promises of reform should be blamed on the sectarian violence that we've seen in, in Western Burma in recent weeks. Um, I, th I think that's a very long-standing conflict. Yeah, I, I want to talk about what's happening in Western Burma. You know, what led to these clashes and what's the current situation, as far as you can tell? It's a very confusing situation. Um, it's a very isolated part of the country relative uh, to the rest of it, but certainly very difficult to get to for journalists and, and for human rights researchers and even a lot of aid workers. I mean, the short-term um, issue is that there were incidents um, involving a crime against um, a rape and a, and a murder of, of a young woman, then the murder of, of uh, more than 10 people on a bus, uh, 10 Muslims on a bus by um, Arakanese, uh, Rakhine people. Um, and then it became an all-out conflagration um, very soon after that, where both sides in this were attacking each other and attacking villages and burning villages down, killing people. Um, and that's very important to, to understand that both sides have a lot to, to be blamed for here. Um, and the security forces were called in. I mean, troops were flown in from, from Rangoon. Um, and to his credit, I think President Thane Sein made a, um, a very strong and, and I think very accurate speech when he called for all sides to calm down, um, that people will be punished for this. Um, and I think most importantly, he said, you know, don't let this get out of control. If this gets out of control, this could potentially derail the reform process. So you thought that the authorities handled this current uh, situation fairly well? I mean, under the circumstances, I, I think they could have handled it much better. They could have been better prepared for it. Um, but, you know, this is clearly a case of communal tensions between two, uh, the Rohingya Muslim community and the Rakhine Buddhist community um, in these areas. It's not something that's been directly exacerbated by the Burmese military. But that said, the background to this, the longer history of this conflict, is really about the Burmese state, the Burmese military, the authorities, and the Rakhine population uh, really marginalising and Ill tr mistreating the Rohingya Muslim population of that state for many years. And there is both the the day-to-day, -day, you know, this grinding marginalisation of the Rohingya population, which numbers uh, nearly a million um, in, in Arakan state. And what about uh, Aung San Suu Kyi's response to this? The, you know, this, is, as you say, is a long-standing issue. Mm. Uh, what has been her response to it, and how would you assess it? it? It hasn't been as good as we would have hoped. I mean, we would have hoped that Dora Aung San Suu Kyi would have spoken out more strongly um, on this issue. She's called for the, uh, the rule of law to prevail. And she's quite right. Uh, but she could have spoken out, I think, a lot more strongly for all sides to, to respect each other um, in this conflict. And she really needs to acknowledge the long-standing persecution of the Rohingya people as, right. as a fundamental part of this conflict. Because she has fundamentally changed her position now from a highbrow dissident to a politician. I mean, what do you expect from her? What would you like her to see now? Well, I, I think she's done a remarkable job under the circumstances in the last year and a half. I mean, going from someone that's been persecuted for a long time and thrown under house arrest for, for more than 15 years, to have come out and actually started negotiating with the government, turned her party's position around, run for parliament, now parliamentarian. I think under the circumstances, she's done an amazing job. Um, but she is a politician now, and she recognises that. And politicians have to speak out on the tough issues. And this is a very tough issue for any political leader in Burma to actually tackle. And you, know, you have to understand that she has issues not only with the broader community, with the government, but within her own party. Um, and some of her party leaders have said some pretty horrendous things about the Rohingya 
over the years. So she has a very difficult role, I think, in actually trying to align her party's position and appeal to the, the broader population. Overall, are you optimistic of Burma's path in the human rights field? Do you, do you see things getting better? Uh, I do see things getting better in some areas, um, and I think that should be encouraged, it should be supported. But I think there are still many, many challenges ahead um, with the role of the army and ongoing abuses by the Burmese military and by non-state armed ethnic groups. I mean, there's still wars going on, even though there's ceasefires, um, uh, that are very encouraging ceasefire processes going on in the country. There's still a culture of abuse within a lot of these, these organisations. There's still very basic freedoms, freedom of expression, freedom of association and assembly that still need to rise to uh, international standards. And there's a lot of people working very hard to get them there. But um, I don't think anyone should be looking at some of the reforms and, and, uh, and, and being what Aung San Suu Kyi has called, you know, beholden to reckless optimism. Um, you know, I think people need to have very clear optimism about the good things that are happening, the bad things that continue ha to happen, and actually getting results to improve the situation. Which means you're, you're, you're going to keep at your job for the next few years. I, I think there'll certainly be a lot of work for um, human rights uh, activists and, and documenters to do, um, unfortunately. But it's getting into a far more interesting phase now where it appears the government and many other parts of, of the authorities do seem more receptive to even acknowledging um, that they have problems and being more receptive to help from the outside world. So. Um, that's very encouraging. Um, but it's still very early days and there's a lot of work to be done. And it has to be said that there's great work being done by Burmese community organisations and civil society in the country, which makes our job much easier. Well, that's a good new, a note to end on. Still more work to be done, but we're getting there. Absolutely. And that's all we have time for, unfortunately. And that's it for this edition of the France Van Cat interview. Stay tuned. We have more news coming up.